have 134 slides. So, um, so, and I've done this before in 60 minutes, and Lynn took five of my minutes with that introduction. So I'm gonna ask you if you could hold your questions until the end. I'm virtually positive that some of the things I'm going to say are gonna make some of you mad uh, or be controversial and you won't agree with me. So we can debate those things uh, hopefully when I get through my, uh, my talk. Um, it is a real honor to be asked to do this and I appreciate it very much. Um, before I, I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, these agencies and organizations, some of which have supported our research on ecotoxicology, looking at the side effects of pesticides in the environment, and also pollinator conservation issues. Um, and I want to dedicate this talk to my folks. Uh, they were unfortunately not able to be here. They're, they're elderly, but uh, they're going to watch this talk when it comes out on the Netflix DVD or wherever Lynn's going to put it, I guess. So, uh, okay. So let's start with a true story. Um, early one summer morning in 2013 in a parking lot uh, in Oregon, where the Target Supercenter parking lot, uh, a, a crew that was uh, involved with professional tree care showed up. They had been asked to spray some linden trees for an aphid infestation. And the problem with the aphids was they were sucking the juices from these linden trees and dropping their sticky fecal matter, the, the honeydew, onto the cars, and there were complaints about that. And of course, you can't spray a parking lot when the customers are there. So they showed up very early, or very early in the morning, right at the crack of dawn. It was still pretty dark, and they sprayed the trees. What they didn't notice was that the trees were in bloom. And uh, they drove away, and it didn't take very long before uh, the shoppers began to arrive. And what they observed when they arrived was 50,000 dead and dying bees, mostly bumblebees, but also honeybees, in their final throes of agony in the parking lot. Obviously, the cell phones came out. Uh, and uh, the next thing you know, the Department of Agriculture officers and the conservation officers and the endangered species biologists showed up. Um, and all hell broke loose, to be perfectly frank. Um, it hit the uh, local news. I mean, even Fox News was concerned about this, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, she's got the wrong kind of bees on the picture, but nonetheless, it hit the local news. It hit the national news. The bee huggers and the tree huggers showed up in droves. Um, the, the company was required to tent the trees, which I'm sure was not cheap. And there were something like 28 of these trees that had to be covered with mesh to keep the bees off the trees for the rest of the period when they were blooming. Um, they held a memorial for thousands of dead bees, um, and um, this resulted in pesticide uh, violations. Uh, the state suspended the pesticide applicator's license, and uh, it hit the national news and even the international news, and ultimately resulted in uh, a ban on a whole group of uh, systemic insecticides um, in the state of Oregon. Uh, this was a real wake up call, a black eye and a wake up call for the land care industry. Um, they violated the label and they could have avoided this if they just read the label. So this was an illegal action, even though it, they don't, did not intend to kill these bees. Uh, it says right on the label, the product's highly toxic to bees, don't apply it or allow it to drift on blooming crops and so on. So this resulted from a label violation, but it was one of several very high profile in incidents that catapulted this industry, this, 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 this issue into the forefront of the land care industry's concerns. Um, why all this attention on bees? Why are people picketing Home Depot and Lowe's to stop selling bee killing pesticides? Why are gardeners being told to not buy plants from garden stores? Um, why are people asking others to storm the EPA. I want to explore these things for a little while. And importantly, I want to talk about what challenges and opportunities does this issue provide for the land care industry. And these are some of the components of the land care industry. Uh, the folks that you see putting in plants or taking care of lawns or taking care of the campus here and so on. And also individual homeowners and property owners. Um, first of all, why do we care about bees? I mean, some people don't like bees. You know, they think they're going to get stung. Well, bees are, of course, really important for their pollination services. Uh, no one knows for sure, but their, their contributions to American agriculture have been valued at something in the range of $20 billion per year. And without bees, uh, a lot of the things that we like to eat would be off the menu. Um, the California almond industry alone uses 
1.4 million colonies of honeybees every year just to pollinate the almond crop. Now, why can't the native bees take care of it? Well, if you look at this, it's a monoculture for miles around and there simply are not enough native bees or flowering plants in that monoculture to sustain this kind of high intensity agriculture. So the bees are shipped in for commercial pollination. Um, without bees, all of this would be off the menu. So we should thank bees if we like to eat fruits and vegetables or yogurt with berries in it. Um, why else can serve bees? Well, they're keystone species for biodiversity. This is Raven Run, and if you've been out there in the spring, it's a beautiful place to walk. And all those wildflowers, at least almost all of them, are pollinated by native bees early in the growing season. And uh, those, uh, those flowers and other plants that are pollinated by bees provide food for birds, for, for other vertebrates, and, and on up the food chain, so very important. Um, in urban landscapes, bees, of course, pollinate our backyard orchards, our community and individual gardens. And importantly, they pollinate the, the, the hollies and, you know, the crab apples and the other types of flowering plants that ultimately produce, produce the fruit and seeds that feeds our urban wildlife. Um, a lot of people don't realize that honeybees are non-native species. Okay, uh, honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought here by the early colonists that were probably honeybees on the Mayflower when the pilgrims came over. They're of European origin. Um, honeybees are the most familiar bees to most people, but in addition to honeybees, there are some 4,000 species of native bees that occur in North America. And these are also very important as pollinators. They're perhaps underappreciated. A few that are very familiar and also, I think, very, very beautiful sweat bees, these iridescent green ones. Um, mason, resin, and leafcutter bees. It's a beautiful picture of a blue orchard bee. Um, bumblebees, and also the mining bees. Most of these bees either live in the soil, they, they, they nest in the soil, or they nest in hollow twigs and things like that. Most people never even notice them. Uh, they're pretty innocuous, but they're very important in pollination. Um, if you're interested in learning more about bee biology, I don't know these people, I don't get a kickback, but this is a really good book, and I brought a copy of it with me if you'd like to look at it afterward. Um, it's just um, really nice, and I've learned a lot about bees just perusing, and it's written for the layperson. It'll even tell you how to build a bee hotel if you want to uh, observe these creatures in your backyard. Um, this is something that people are often confused about. Bees and wasps are not the same thing. Okay, and bees are herbivores. They feed their young on pollen and nectar. They are herbivores. They have to visit flowers. Bees have adaptations that enable them to be good pollinators. They're fuzzy with branched hairs like Christmas trees that catch the pollen. They have combs and other adaptations to ball the pollen up, and they can carry it in special baskets, many of them, sort of like a running back running with a football. Um, and they feed their larvae on pollen and nectar. So they are intimately associated with flowers. Wasps, on the other hand, are predators. They feed their larvae on meat, mostly chopped up caterpillars that they go out and catch. And wasps are bold, or else they have only sparse hairs. So if you see wasps coming to your can of Coca-Cola, that's five hour energy for them as they go about their day. But uh, they're really looking for prey to feed their larvae. Um, honeybees are docile unless you go looking for trouble. And uh, most of our native bees uh, will very rarely sting. So you can pet them and pick them up and they're very nice creatures. Um, most of the stings that occur in urban settings are actually wasps, mainly yellow jackets. And those are almost all invasive species. So if you wanna go ahead and nuke the yellow jackets, that's okay with me, okay? <laughs> but leave the bees alone. Um, Honeybees and native bees have been having a tough time of it recently, and the public is increasingly aware of this and wants to uh, help do something about it. Um, U.S. beekeepers uh, are losing very high percentages of their colonies. Um, for the last 10 years or so, the colony losses have averaged more than 30%. And in, in just one season here, 2015 to 16, in some of our neighboring states, the losses were 60% or more. Okay, And this has caused a great deal of concern. And, and consortia of scientists have gotten together to try to figure out what's going on. But this is higher than it's historically been. Um, native bees are declining too. And I just, this is a paper from the National Academy of Sciences Journal 
uh, indicating that uh, bumblebees are declining across the North America and also worldwide. And uh, this is uh, the rusty hatched bumblebee that was just recently listed as an endangered species in spite of Donald Trump trying to get it unlisted um, in 2017. Um, why are bee populations declining? The, the reasons are not the same entirely for honeybees and native bees, although there's some overlap. Um, most scientists agree that there's no single cause for declining bee populations. Rather, interactions between different stresses are involved. What are some of those types of stresses? For honeybees, the number one factor that is associated with colony decline and loss are blood-sucking parasitic mites called varroa mites. And these in also are invasive species, okay? And these mites will suck the juices out of the larvae, the pupae, and the adult bees. And they also carry and transmit deadly bee diseases. So you can imagine something the size of a dinner plate on your back, maybe five of them, okay? That's not gonna help you get through your day, okay? Varroa mites are bad, and they're very closely associated with a lot of the colony losses. Um, why else are honeybees declining? Exotic bee diseases. And there are a number of diseases that have been introduced from other places in the world, viruses that deform the wings, fungi that cause sort of a dysentery effect in bees, and a number of others. Some of these are transmitted by the varroa mites, but these are contributing to colony decline. Um, and some of these honeybee diseases, it's recently been learned, are spilling over into native bee populations, and that's bad news. So this is a paper that was in Science, a uh, very good journal. Uh, bumblebees are becoming infected with uh, honeybee diseases. So that's not good news. Now, here's an interesting one. Why are bees declining? High fructose corn syrup. What does that have to do with it? Well, with the loss of colonies, the beekeepers are taking more and more of the honey from the bees to keep up the profits and replacing it by feeding the colonies high fructose corn syrup. And we all know that this is good and that's bad for babies. Uh, it turns out that honey has um, antibodies and other types of things that are found in breast milk. Well, not exactly the same stuff, but the idea is it's like colostrum for baby bees. Okay, it boosts the baby bee's immune system. And when you take the honey away, replace it with corn syrup, the bees are much more susceptible to these other stresses, especially the diseases. So this little kid got it right. You get more bees with real honey. Okay, that's a factor. Travel stress. Okay, you might not think it, but most of these uh, honeybee colonies have more frequent flyer miles than any of us put together. Um, why? Because honeybees, except the ones that are, you know, selling honey by the roadside on the way down to Russell Springs, um, the real money in beekeeping is in commercial pollination. So most of the hives in America are being put on trucks and shipped all over the United States, up into the Northwest to do apples, and then maybe down to California to do avocados and things like that on the East Coast, up to, to do cranberries and the Great Lakes, and then down to Florida for citrus and so on. So they're on the road all the time. They're packed together where the diseases and the varroa mites can spread from one colony to another. This is something we can do about, and this is gonna be the theme of a lot of my, rest of my talk, habitat loss, okay? This picture, I think, speaks for itself. Um, these bees require two things, sources of food, pollen and nectar, and nesting habitat, which is uh, loose soil, loose ground, uh, twigs, uh, tree snags, holes in trees, and there's not much of that stuff in that neighborhood. By else, environmental stressors, monocultures of crops where this corn may bloom or produce pollen once during the year and then there's nothing else and of course the the roundup ready crops don't have flowering weeds for the most part like they used to and so it's 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 less varied less nutritious pollen and nectar and i don't want to dip downplay at all um, acute or chronic exposure to pesticides as we'll see that can be a factor um, it's a perfect storm so if people ask, why are bee colonies declining? Why are honeybees declining? Why are native bees declining? It's not one thing. It's a perfect storm of interacting factors. Some more, some less important for native bees or honeybees. Um, and these things interact with each other, okay? So uh, a honeybee colony that is infected with varroa mites or has diseases may become more susceptible to insecticide exposure. Uh, a colony that's exposed to uh, sublethal levels of insecticides may become more susceptible to um, 
to parasites for the diseases and vice versa. So it's sort of like this, the varroa mites, the diseases and the management stress and habitat loss are the concussion. And you can recover from a concussion, but it's a lot harder to do it if you're being kicked in the head at the same time. And the insecticide exposures can be sort of the analogy, the, the kick in the head. We don't want to be kicking bees in the head. Um, the public doesn't really understand a whole lot of that, at least some of the public don't, um, because the people like a simple solution. Uh, public perception is that it's all pesticides, especially neonicotinoid pesticides. And you can see from this particular flyer, it's no longer Mr. We know, not only in italics, but underlined what is killing the bees. And, you know, it's got to be the one thing. Um, it's, it's understandable that there's a lot of confusion about this issue because there's a lot of conflicting stories. I and mean, the research is coming out fast and furious. And just here on the NBC News, which I watch every night, you know, in a few, a few weeks time, here's a story that says that neonics are causing bee populations to crash. And here's two other stories that's saying it ain't necessarily so. So um, it is, there is a lot of controversy here. Um, let's talk about what these are. What are neonicotinoids and why does the land care industry use them? Okay, and some of you know this and some perhaps don't. Um, the reason they use them is it's not easy being green. Okay, and we have some pretty devastating insect pests out there. These are white grubs that have destroyed a cemetery. Nobody wants to go out on Memorial Day and see that. Um, and this is a, a pretty valuable birch tree that I photographed in Michigan that was killed by bronze birch borer. And both of these could have been prevented with uh, with the use of these insecticides. And again, it's not easy being green. There's a whole variety of fairly destructive insect pests that are out there. And there's a whole industry that's charged with um, preventing the loss of ash trees on our campus like that, or uh, dealing with Japanese beetles or leaf miners or grubs in people's lawns or golf courses. And neonics are synthetic insecticides that are chemically related to nicotine, they largely replaced the much more acutely toxic organophosphates and carbamates in the 1990s. They're selectively more toxic to insects than to mammals or fish. What that really means is that they have relatively low toxicity to people and squirrels and stuff like that. Um, there, some of these neonics are moderately toxic to birds, and I don't want to downplay that, but the extent of the direct hazard in the real world is still controversial. There, I, I just this afternoon I read a paper that suggested that birds in, in farm environments may be at risk or hazard because they consume the neonic infested seeds. And, and that's uh, something I think that uh, certainly is a very real possibility. The reason that they're in so many homeowner products is because they tend to be relatively um, non-hazardous for people to handle and use. Um, this is why they're used so much, because they're systemic. They can be applied to the soil or injected or applied to the trunk of the tree, and then they're translocated upward to all parts of the canopy where they can control insects like wood borers that are under the bark or insects that are hiding in the undersides of leaves at the tops of trees that could never be reached in any practical way with sprays. Um, and they're applied in a variety of different ways. They can be injected into the tree using sort of an IV type system for the tree. Um, they can be sprayed on the lower bark and then they're translocated through the bark up into the tree. They can be applied as a drench just from a bucket to the base of the plant. Um, and, you know, these have really transformed the way that we do tree care. When I say we, I mean the industry does tree care. You know, we used to go out and spray trees like this, and here's some clown that's spraying a flowering tree to control Japanese beetles in California, and no doubt dropping bees all over the place. We can go from this to a much more targeted application, which is less of an issue from the standpoint of spray drift, hazard to bystander, and obviously we have some situations uh, in, in crowded urban environments where sprays simply can't be used. Um, they're effective, okay? Uh, so this is, these are uh, ash trees on uh, Merritt Golf Course out on, uh, on Newtown Pike, and the superintendent intentionally left some untreated to justify to the Greens Committee why they wanted to have a budget for this. And this tree was treated once, five years later, it still looks great. These trees were not treated and they're, they're, they're gone. Uh, this is Idle Hour Golf Course on, uh, on Richmond Road, uh, not treated and treated. 
And um, this is, you know, whether you like golf or you don't like golf, this is unacceptable on a quality golf course. So they use these things. And they're also useful for managing the spread of invasive species or for managing the pests themselves. So things like hemlock, uh, along at hemlock scale, calico scale, Japanese beetle, all these pictures were taken on the UK campus. Okay, and some of these are, are tree killing pests. And some of them can be spread around on nursery stock. We have an enormous infestation of calico scale, as you know, Jerry, right on those, uh, on the trees in front of the hospital. And I'm pretty sure they were brought in on the trees. If that had been managed at the nursery, we wouldn't be dealing with it now. Okay. In the landscape, neonic use is actually a very small percentage of what, what, what overall national usage is. It's right here, this little purple line. It's a tiny fraction of neonic use. But the, the, the land care industry has always been low-hanging fruit for the debate about should we or shouldn't we ban pesticides. Okay, and it used to be that some of the pesticides we used in landscapes and lawns were pretty toxic, but today they've become really much less toxic to vertebrates. Um, so the bee issue has become a new driver for those pressures. I'm not gonna weigh in on whether we should or shouldn't ban neonic Italian insecticide, that's above my pay station, but I'm gonna try to present a balanced picture. This has put the growers and the landscape managers between the devil and the deep blue sea, because on one hand, they're being asked by the American public to save their trees, to produce a, a quality lawn or a golf course that can be playable. But on the other hand, um, they're caught in this maelstrom about, uh, about uh, pesticides and so on. So although landscape usage is probably a very minuscule and infrequent thing as far as impacting overall bee populations, that doesn't mean it's harm they're harmless to bees. That first example of the bee kill in Oregon should convince you that these things are not good for bees, okay? And again, the problem is that they're systemic and they can be taken up and transferred into pollen and nectar and they can stay there for a long time, months or even several years and pose a hazard to bees. The research certainly shows, and I could show you dozens of papers that have come out in the last five years, that at high enough dosages, these insecticides can kill bees outright and sublethal exposures can impair colony function. Things like homing behavior, communication, colony reproduction can be compromised at high enough dosages. So, you know, this is a, a big question. Is there an acceptable threshold for bee hazard from insecticides in urban landscapes? If so, how should we balance that against the pest management benefits, given that there are some very significant tree pests and turf pests that we really don't have any alternatives that are effective uh, for the time being, at least. Uh, here's a, a, a good question and a fact. All current effective insecticides for emerald ash borer are systemic and all of them, including MMEC and benzoate, are intrinsically toxic to bees. This is a before and after shot of a street in Toledo, Ohio, emerald ash borer. And the question is, if this was your street, would saving the trees have been justified, okay? And I, I can't answer that. That's an individual decision. But you can imagine the cost of replacing those trees, the lost ecosystem services of those trees. And certainly we would all agree it would have been better to have a planned replacement of those trees rather than having them all die at the same time, okay? So those are the things. Now I want part two of my talk. I wanna start talking about our research. I want to give a, a shout out to four graduate students of mine, Jonathan Larson, PhD 2014, Emily Dobbs, Masters, and two current students, Emily, are uh, Bernie Mock and Adam Baker, and you may know uh, Adam and Bernie, uh, they're still around. Um, in our lab, we have been focused on a couple of questions over the last five or six years. Um, can we establish best management practices for integrated pest and pollinator management? Can we find ways to steward or use these insecticides more safely until we can replace them with something better? Okay, and then can we use this pollinator issue to promote uh, more sustainable landscapes? Because the public cares about pollinators and we think that this can be a driver for positive social change in things like lawn care and I'm going to show you why. With our, our lawn studies, we've been working with white clover, 
in lawns because this is ubiquitous in lawns in Lexington. Even the lawns that are on lawn care have white clover in them. It's hard to get rid of it all. Okay, and we know that white clover is really good for bees and we try to get people not to kill it. But nonetheless, um, it is a potential hazard for bees when it's sprayed. Um, we work with bumblebee colonies because bumblebees are much cheaper than honeybees. They're doorstep pollinators that occur in everybody's backyard and they overwinter as queens, a single queen. And in the springtime, early in the spring, the queen comes out and she founds a new colony in the spring. So she's out flying around, gathering pollen and nectar and laying some eggs and starting her little new colony right at the time when our lawn care applications are being made for white grubs. Um, we looked at two chemical classes, a couple of neonicotinoids that the lawn care industry uses and a new product, an anthranilic diamide with a very different chemistry. And I can't explain how this works, but it's very target selective for beetles and caterpillars and not for bees. Um, this is an example of EPA green chemistry. Um, we applied our applications right when uh, the industry does this for lawn care uh, and also at the time when the bumblebee queens are out founding their colony. Um, we use, this is what the bumblebee colonies look like. They're a little bigger than a shoebox. They start with a queen and 20 workers. Uh, we applied these chemicals at their label rates, watered them in, um, we're attempting to simulate a lawn care application that might be applied on a Monday, and then the homeowner does not mow the turf until the following weekend, and this happens all the time. Um, once the turf was treated, it was watered in, the, the residues had dried, the next day we challenged the turf with these bee colonies. And this is Jonathan out counting bees, and we noticed immediately, within a day or two, a lot fewer bees flying around where the neonicotinoid had been sprayed. We knew that there was something up. When we opened these colonies after six days, again, a realistic exposure, we saw 58% fewer live bees and threefold more dead bees in the colonies that had been stressed by their exposure to the neonic. And that's not surprising. It says right on the label, don't spray it on flowering plants. But it's awfully hard to ensure that doesn't happen in commercial lawn care. This was really interesting and new information that in this actual usage scenario, really a worst case scenario, absolutely no effect from the alternative chemistry. We took these colonies, this is actually several experiments, but I'm summarizing. We took them to a safe site, Gainsway Horse Farm, and we left them out there where there's no insecticides are being used on the horse farm all summer long. We left them out there to complete colony development, brought them back at the end of the summer. Periodically, Jonathan would go out and weigh the colonies to see how they were doing. He took about a dozen stings, but that's what grad students are for, you know, <laughs> take one for the team. Um, and what we saw was really very striking. The colonies that had had just a six-day exposure in this simulated lawn care setting never caught up. Here's that initial setback, and this is colony weight. And they began to recover come mid midsummer, but they never caught up to the other colonies. Here's this alternative chemistry that's doing just as well as the non-exposed colony. Now, bumblebee colonies have to reach a critical weight in order to reproduce. If they don't reach that weight, they don't switch over to producing new queens. When we evaluated colony health at the end of the summer, and here's the queen, what we found was really striking. Um, the colonies that exposed just for six days back in May never reproduced. They never produced new queens. That setback was sufficient that they'd never reached that critical mass. On the other hand, the non-treated ones and the ones that we used, we exposed to this alternative chemistry, it's a new chemistry, uh, no adverse effects. Um, you know, the obvious question is, do the bees smell it or do they avoid the sprays? Maybe it's not an issue if they don't go there. So this was a big field of clover on the UK campus out by the rugby fields. Uh, we, we sprayed plots on here. We counted bees visiting the plots. Easy experiment. They do not avoid the sprayed flowers. Okay, so uh, the exposure scenario is, is very real. Um, this has all been published, and this is a more complicated story than I've told you, but I think I've given you the gist of it. Direct exposure to neonic residues on flowering lawn weeds is harmful to bees. Okay, and that's not a great surprise. It says so right on the label. Don't do that. Um, we did find ways that we could mitigate the hazard. For those companies that can't afford the new product, 
we found that mowing the flower heads before or after treatment really helped mitigate the adverse effects. We also found that using a granular formulation, which falls down and doesn't actually contaminate the flowers, also helped to mitigate some of these effects. But all things being equal, I think it's better off that they not use neonicotinoids on lawns from what we've seen. So I think the most important finding from this was that we identified an even more effective grub product, uh, a non-neonic that is apparently completely non-hazardous to bees. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, we've been communicating this kind of stuff to thousands of practitioners over the last several years, and it is having an impact. For example, this is GrubX. It's the most widely sold grub product in North America. And you can find this at any Home Depot or Lowe's or garden store. And in response to some of our work, Scott took the neonic out of GrubX and put the other product in. And now they're selling that as a bee-friendly product. So it's a positive change for sure. What about woody plants? Okay, this is, a, this is an urban forestry initiative. I haven't said anything about woody plants or not much. Um, you know, we're very interested in seeing if we could find best management practices to mitigate the hazard here. So Bernie Mock, my grad student, um, this was actually a really time-consuming project. Three woody plant species, two different neonics, three different timings. This would be uh, autumn, pre-bloom, and then if we wait till they drop their flowers, could we control the scale insects or the borers after they've dropped the flowers? And um, this was, was uh, a lot of crazy work. I'll never do it again. We collected thousands and thousands of tiny flowers from these plants over multiple times. We uh, prepped the flowers, we put them into tubes, and we centrifuged the flowers to get the nectar out, collected the nectar. This is how much you get from about 300 flowers. Um, this took about two years to do this experiment after we figured out how to do it. And the bottom line at the end of it is that we've published it. It just came out a month ago. And um, what we found was regardless of application timing, it's bad news, okay? This stuff is hanging around in the nectar for up to two years after we treat, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you follow the label and wait for the flowers to fall off. It's there the following spring. So this is uh, not good news. Uh, and uh, so what do, we, what do we recommend from this, okay? Do not use neonicotinoids on the attractive trees and shrubs unless there's no other practical way to save or protect the plant, okay? There's other ways to control tent caterpillars on a crab apple tree in my front yard, and they shouldn't be used on a plant like that. Um, that's the bottom line. Now, this is a harder question. Are these things impacting bee populations on a landscape level, on the campus, for example, or in Lexington in general? Um, and um, we have to understand a little bit about toxicology here. Toxicology hazard is toxicity times exposure. Okay, that's like toxicology 101. So the rays of the sun uh, are toxic. And if we have high exposure, there's high hazard. And if we can reduce the exposure, we have lower hazard. And we all know that. Um, unlike agricultural settings, you know, the almonds or um, a monoculture of canola or something where the bees are foraging on one thing and all the plants are being treated, certainly on a, something like the UK campus where I imagine neonic insecticide use is very rare, right, Jerry? Maybe just occasionally for ash trees or something like that. The risk of exposure here is going to be much, much lower. Now, Taking this to a recommendation at the homeowner level, you know, there's a set of consumer attractive plants. So let's call it this big circle. And then only a subset of those are bee attractive. Okay, many evergreens, for example, are not bee attractive. Um, and then there are only a very small fraction of those that are actually treated with insecticides in any given year. Um, um, most of my neighbors never treat their trees and shrubs with insecticides. That's where the hazard is, right there relatively few plants. So if we can identify those plants, we can put out a warning. And here are some of the hazardous ones. We absolutely should keep systemic insecticides away from linden trees, cherry laurels, single roses, hawthorns. These are buggy plants that have pests, but are also very attractive to bees. There are other ways. The label should be written to exclude use on these types of plants. On the other hand, Conifers don't pose any hazard to bees. So if you get pine needle scales on your mugo pines, at least you're not going to be hurting bees if you treat them. 
Hybrid roses attract almost no bees with the double petal. So uh, maybe people can use these for Japanese beetles. I don't know. Ash trees are wind pollinated. They do not produce, they're not a nectar source for bees. So again, we're getting into cost and benefit. Um, so anyway, I want to shift because I want to go on the positive side now, the opportunities. Okay, and I hope you, I haven't defended neonics. I'm trying to give you a balanced picture of the way I, as I see it. The best way that we can help urban pollinators is to give them more and better food. And I'll stand by that. Okay, um, pollinator friendly land care is good for the industry. This is Springhouse Gardens, their pollinator day, and they've got the plants labeled up the ones that are good for butterflies and bees, and they're selling plants. Um, this is a garden center. The Million Pollinator Garden Challenge is a very popular thing. We all know about Monarch Way Station. People are interested in helping pollinators and gardening for pollinators. This is Emily Dobbs and a project that uh, we did with Emily and uh, was co-sponsored by the U.S. Golf Association and Syngenta of all people uh, called Operation Pollinator for Golf Courses. And most people have a negative image of golf courses from an environmental standpoint. But the fact is that many golf courses in America are trying to go this way. Okay, this is Kearney Hills Golf Course out in uh, North Lexington, out Georgetown Road. And um, Purple Martin Box, wetlands, milkweed here, uh, lots and lots of flowers. Why does this benefit the golf course? They can take all of those areas out of maintenance. Okay, they don't have to water them, they don't have to fertilize them or mow them or spray them or anything. They can put up a sign that says it's a nature sanctuary and people understand and they can focus their budget where it needs to be focused. Um, we were interested in seeing if we could work with golf courses to promote this kind of thing. We developed a seed mix for the Ohio Valley region, talking with experts like Sharon Bale in the horticulture department. Um, we didn't know what we're doing. We're entomologists. We went out to, uh, this is Lakeside Golf Course. This is Lakeside Golf Course out on Richmond Road. And we, we scalped down areas, we, we, we cleared out the, the weeds that would compete, we scarified, we hand seeded these things. And lo and behold, we grew wildflowers like crazy. And this is the same plot on um, Lakeside Drive, Lake, uh, Lakeside Golf Course. Uh, you can see the turnover. This is landscape Coreopsis, and some of this is bergamot and, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the New England asters and coneflowers. And the same tree, that tree there, and that, I think that tree and that tree are the same tree. Okay. Um, we documented 49 types of bees visiting these uh, plots on the Lexington area golf courses, including three uh, declining or threatened uh, bumblebee species on the golf courses. We publicized this in trade journals, national trade journals serving the golf industry. We were the first to bring this to North America. By spring 2017, three years after the project, 250 golf courses had adopted Operation Pollinator, including all of the Marriott resort, resort golf courses in North America. The Marriott CEO saw this and said, I want to do this. So baby steps, okay, baby steps. But we can make golf courses more environmentally friendly. This is another project we have ongoing right now being co-sponsored by the U.S. Golf Association, Operation Monarch for golf courses. And I think that picture speaks for itself. We're looking at ways that we can establish monarch butterfly habitat in out of play areas of this major urban and para-urban land type. Um, trees for bees. This is, I'm gonna spend most of the rest of my time on this project. This is Bernie Mock, and she's doing this as a major part of her PhD. Um, and I wanna tell you what we're trying to do. Uh, a single tree or shrub, as we know, can provide thousands of flowers with high quality pollen and nectar for bees, far more on a per area basis than equivalent patch of, you know, daffodils or, or whatever herbaceous uh, flowering plants you might have there. Um, but trees are underappreciated as far as their value for urban pollinators. Um, there are lots of lists of pollinator friendly plants. Most of these lists are not really based on any hard science. They're based upon observations and anecdotes and sort of um, popular knowledge. But uh, lots and lots of lists, but almost none of them focus on woody plants. Um, and those that do, here's one that says maples and serviceberry. This is from the Pollinator Partnership Trees and Shrubs. They simply say bees or bees and flies. And so the question is, what type of bees? How be attractive is it? It's just a name on a list. 
So we set out to sample 75 species of woody ornamental plants. And many of these were on the campus at the UK Arboretum, all over Lexington. You'll see some of the sites. We sampled five sites per plant, 250 bees per plant species. Over 18,000 bees were identified from this. These are just some of the plants, about a third of the ones that we have looked at over the last four years. Um, our sample sites range from central Kentucky on up into uh, southern Ohio and all the way out to um, Louisville, the cemeteries and such in Louisville. And you can see some of those types of sites here. Um, they included municipal and institutional landscapes. This is a planting of flowers at Commonwealth Stadium. This is in front of the Ag Science Building in Amur uh, Arboreta, Lexington Cemetery, home landscapes, street trees, uh, 375 sites. Um, each sample was washed, dried, pinned. Bees were identified to genus or species. It's just not easy. Bernie knows how to do it. We also uh, compared the plant's attractiveness via snapshot counts. And it's very difficult to, you know, gauge a tree versus a shrub. They're very different in size and so on. So we ended up using timed counts of how many bees we observed in two 30-second counts, two independent observers, and then averaging those. What we saw was really interesting. Different woody ornamentals attract unique bee assemblages. Okay, so here's a assemblage from a flower and crab apple, and here's an assemblage from a fuzzy dutzia. If you don't like carpenter bees, maybe you don't want a fuzzy dutzia in your yard, but uh, you get the idea. Um, we saw a lot of site to site variation, even within a plant. So this is a devil's walking stick. It's a fantastic bee tree, it's a magnet for bees. Uh, site one, mostly honeybees. Site two, entirely sweat bees in that case. Okay, so we did see a lot of variation that we haven't been able to explain. It has to do with the nesting site availability, but there were definitely patterns. The diversity and richness of the bees uh, varied by different plants. And in some cases, you know, the mock orange this is a native plant, but you can see very little diversity there. In fact, about 90% of the bees we got on mock orange were a single specialist species that gathers resin from the mock orange. So even though it's a native plant, it doesn't support a lot of bee diversity. On the other hand, here's a chase tree. Late summer blooming tree, non-native, lots and lots, five different families of bees visiting the chase tree. Okay, uh, flower form matters. And I could go on about this for a while, but um, double petaled roses, useless. Okay, the bees can't get there. It, you know, it's really not a hazard if people treat them for Japanese beetles or rose slug sawflies or you know, black spot because they're not attracting any bees anyway. Uh, these flowers, these plants that are covered with sterile sepals are not attracting any bees, but flower form matters. Um, this was a big question and this is where I'll get into trouble. Um, are natives best for bees? And we all know uh, the, um, the, the, the argument, uh, mainly from Doug Calamy's group, and it's a very good argument, that native plants support more native herbivores like caterpillars because those native caterpillars are more adapted to the chemistry of the native trees and that caterpillars in turn feed urban wildlife like birds. Okay, so that's all good. Question is, does it matter for pollinators? And looking at this, you would think that it does. Turns out it doesn't. Okay, here are six relatively non-attractive plants, half of which are native and half of which are non-native. Here are six or seven of the most attractive plants for bees. And you can see that uh, we've got about an equal number of native and non-native plants in that list as well. Um, we found overwhelmingly that both native and non-native woody trees and shrubs can be very attractive and uh, uh, support diverse assemblages of bees. Here are some really attractive uh, um, native plants. Some of these are very nice landscape plants, but here are a number of non-native plants that attract just as many bees. Um, some great shrubs for bees. Some of these are native, some are non-native. Now, I'll bet if you're like me, you've probably never heard of some of these. I hadn't, I assume that, you know, I mean, if you go to the garden store, all you see is boxwoods and azaleas, right? But we ought to be planting more of these, okay? And a lot of these are relatively pest-free. I'm an entomologist and I can't even think of a pest on any of these plants. Okay, so they don't need to be treated with insecticides, which is part of a sustainable landscape. 
we are recommending based upon this, at least from the standpoint of pollinator conservation, I'm not a, I'm not a bird person, but I, I get that argument too, that diverse landscapes emphasizing native plants, but with some non-invasive exotics. We're not, we don't want any aristocrat pears that are invasive. I get that too. But the plants that, everything we sampled is a non-invasive plant. We didn't include any invasives. These exotics often bloom earlier in the year or later in the year than most of our natives. So Cornelian cherry dogwood, Cornus moss, is a tremendous bee magnet and it blooms in March and it supports the bumblebee queens when they're coming out of the ground and the early season um, uh, ground nesting bees, the andrenid bees. Bottle brush buckeye, a native, uh, terrific for midsummer. But then in the late summer when the the bumblebee queens are getting ready, they're putting on weight to overwinter like bears going into hibernation. This is just about the only flowering tree left on campus. It's still in bloom. And there's one right outside the building. And it's a beautiful tree with exfoliating bark. And it is probably the number one tree for bumblebees, although it's covered with honeybees here. So I don't know, I mean, this is beyond my pay station. Is planting a seven suns tree out in the courtyard here necessarily a bad thing? From the bumblebee standpoint, it's a very good thing. Okay, um, what we're suggesting is, uh, you know, like a, a menu here, you choose some from the spring, some from the early summer, some from the late summer column, um, and you can have a bee-friendly landscape. Um, part of our funding came from the Horticultural Research Institute, and they've posted this list on their website, and it's had, you know, like tens of thousands of hits in a very short time. Um, and, and I want to show you one example of where that, that list actually had uh, an influence. Um, not necessarily here, but this, is, this creates a lot of marketing opportunities for our growers, you know, Kentucky proud pollinator friendly plants, if you will. Um, they, there is a market for these tags that you can put into a plant that says pollinator friendly plant. And this is Springhouse Gardens, a very nice local garden center that has an annual pollinator day and they promote, here's the monarch butterfly in the window there. Um, I called this guy, I found this website, Rockbridge Trees, and his uh, thing is trees for bees. Okay, and we looked at his list on his website and it looks a lot like our list. So I called him up on the day when the university was closed because of the snow and talked to the guy, he was fantastic. Farmer Dave is his name on the website. And he said, yeah, he saw our list and a lot of what was on his list was influenced by what was on our list. And that's, I think that's a positive thing, okay? And a marketing opportunity. Many of the best bee magnets are also nearly pest free, okay? Okay, you guys that do tree care, Jerry and, and Ian and so on. Do these things have any pests? I don't think so. They're, well, not very many, okay? They're pretty good plants and they're pretty bug free. So they don't have to be treated with neonic insecticides and they're bee magnets. So I'm suggesting that for sustainable landscapes, we've got to stop planting boxwood lindens, roses, azaleas, hawthorns, hybrid hollies, and all these other buggy plants that are overplanted anyway, and start diversifying our landscapes with some of these. Okay. Um, promoting low input lawns helps support urban pollinators. And um, we are always trying to get people to lay off the lawn care in their backyard, okay? Because clover is one of the absolute best plants for urban pollinators, we know that. Um, Hooray, okay. We um, surveyed um, about uh, 38 lawn sites in Lexington. These are mostly places like the lawn out in front of uh, the Red Mile or at Glendover Elementary School and so on. We recorded more than 50 species of pollinators visiting uh, dandelions and clover in Lexington, published that. Uh, this paper came out in Journal of Insect Conservation. We got an email from the journal that said our paper had now hit the top 1% of all articles ever in the article that had been shared on social media, all metrics. And I assume that's people that are tweeting this to their neighbor and saying, get off my back about my crappy lawn. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a pollinator sanctuary. But anyway, um, it's good. We have a project with Greg Munshaw in uh, Plant Cell Sciences now on microclover lawns. 
And microclover is a, a clover that's selected for smaller flower size and smaller leaf size so it can integrate and not clump so much, integrate with tall fescue. And it makes a very nice lawn. It never needs fertilizing because it fixes its own nitrogen. So no phosphorus, no nitrogen. Stays green all year. And we now know that it also doesn't get white grubs. So it never needs to be treated. Um, this is some of our research out on the farm establishing this. And you can see there's, there's a lot of blooms on some of those microclover plots. And again, this is with Greg. Um, we have sampled it for bees, and we know that the microclover attracts almost exactly the same assemblage and assortment of bees that the conventional Dutch white clover attracts. So this is my microclover backyard, and I think it looks pretty nice, okay? And that's like in July. We don't water it, we don't fertilize it, and it has lots of bees on it, and the bunnies like it too. So um, we're trying to promote this. My wife and I were traveling in Scotland uh, two summers ago. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to go there. And um, we, we, we visited a little summer residence, and this was a backyard here, and the little lawn here was covered with little white flowers, okay? And it just so happens that this backyard was the view out the bedroom window of the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth. And I would like to suggest that if it's good enough for Her Majesty, a few white flowers in a backyard in Lexington should be good enough for us. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna wrap it up. Conserving pollinators benefits urban habitats in a variety of ways. Um, diversify landscapes with pest resistant flowering plants to eliminate the need for treating with neonicotinoids for one thing. Okay, I don't have it on my slide here, that we still have some pest situations like emerald ash border where we don't have alternatives to some of the systemics for protecting the trees. Um, unfortunately, that product that's bee friendly and lawn care, it's not very systemic. So it's not a substitute, but we're looking at other alternative chemistries and progress is being made. Um, I suggest, we suggest that uh, a combination of mainly native plants, but some non-invasive non-natives, mainly to extend the growing season, is perhaps the best strategy for a pollinator-friendly landscape. Um, can this stuff change societal expectations? Can this move us toward um, polyculture lawns rather than the monoculture grass? Uh, can it reduce pesticides and so on? I think so. I mean, in my lifetime, we've seen positive societal change in things like smoking and, and uh, recycling and driving fuel efficient cars. And these powerful symbols of conservation, I think are being joined by bees and monarch butterflies as drivers of societal change. I think if we promote this stuff, we can use those charismatic, iconic insects to um, educate the public and then hopefully through baby steps at least, begin to move this very large industry uh, from the scenes on the left more toward the scenes on the right. So um, that's my spiel. I got it in, 134 slides. And <laughs>